All right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining the call today. Uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce the organization, CARC organization, the tracks, and then talk about today's topic. So CARC is basically an organization for all the research computing and data professionals. Uh, it's an open organization. Anyone can just join in. Uh, there's different uh, research uh, facings uh, where there is a year-round conference. So that's called People Network. So we have these different facing tracks. Uh, then there are different working groups uh, that focuses on, focus on different aspects of uh, research computing and data. Uh, interest groups are, uh, again, tackling some different uh, uh, aspects of RCD uh, that are listed on this slide or all slide. And then there's the organization uh, group which uh, supports uh, CARC uh, logistics and engagement. So the there are five CARC people network tracks, uh, data facing, emerging centers, researcher facing, systems facing, and strategy and policy facing. So uh, the strategy and policy facing track is what uh, we, foc we are going to focus on in this particular call. Well, uh, the participants are mostly uh, people who are in the leadership role at various uh, research computing uh, units at different uh, academic institutes uh, and also uh, some other institutes uh, uh, that are not for profit like national labs and so on. Uh, and we discuss uh, uh, strategies uh, and policies uh, uh, that uh, are commonly, th the issues associated with that that are commonly encountered by these folks. Uh, if you want to involve, uh, all you have to do is just uh, uh, go to cart.org slash how to join. And then there's the detailed instruction on how you can participate. Uh, you have to just simply subscribe to the mailing list. You'll get invites to uh, our monthly calls. Um, and you can attend the calls as per your liking. Uh, there's also uh, email, uh, get started at cart.org uh, to uh, contribute. Uh, to the people network track calls. Uh, if you're interested in working group, there's that email, get involved at card.org. We also, uh, so this is the strategy and policy facing track committee. Um, we all are always on the look for uh, new track committee members. Uh, um, I just realized I, I should have included Jason's name here. Jason, uh, recently, Jason Smith recently joined the steering committee. Uh, sorry, Jason Sims uh, joined, recently joined the steering committee. So I will fix that. So we have our committee calls uh, first Wednesday uh, at uh, uh, noon uh, Eastern. Uh, and for the October, we haven't yet to, uh, zeroed in on the topic. So if you are interested in contributing to what that topic would be, feel free to reach out to me or Patrick or other steering committee members or um, uh, just send us an email um, and we will be uh, happy to take that. For today's topic, uh, we are going to talk about who makes uh, decisions for campus research computing and data programs. Uh, uh, basically, the organizational, how it relates to the organizational structure and how the decisions are uh, made how and the budget and all the policies are uh, planned out. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Patrick uh, uh, to start off with, uh, to give us some background information uh, that he has collected through the uh, uh, data collection project. Thanks. So, um... I'm just going to snag the screen. Um, all I want to do is um, show you some data that we have that has um, been gathered as a result of people entering information and us gathering information about their institutional demographics as part of the capabilities model. This is the data portal on the Nexus. Um, and it has a bunch of different data, but for today, I'm going to look at some of the community demographics, in particular, some of these demographic charts. Now, um, there's a whole bunch of different charts in here that you can go exploring on. This just shows sort of the range of different institutions that um, are actually contributing to this data. But in particular, we talked a little bit about in the profile about how or the organizational model um, 
impacts us. And what we know from what people have, have told us, and we still have about a fourth of the contributors who we don't know um, what exactly their model is, but for many of them, um, we actually know that somewhat over half are actually centralized in some manner. Um, and then there's a fair number that are actually organized in school or department. And then some campuses are decentralized. Um, and then there's a, a small percentage that have no organized support at all. If we look at a subset of that, like just the R1s, we see the R1s tend to have, uh, they're more centralized um, and none of them lack any support at all. If we just look at the R2s, we see many more that are in a school or department um, or decentralized. And if we look at the ones beyond our ones in our twos, um, you see that it's even broader and quite a few of them don't have any support, but there's lots that are decentralized or in a school. So I just thought that was, it's kind of interesting to understand how that distribution works. Another thing that people tell us about is their reporting structure, where within the university do they, is their organization reporting up through primarily? And again, what we see um, across the broad community is about 40% of them report up through a central IT group. Uh, about one in seven or so report up into research. Um, again, about the same number are reporting to the provost or a dean. Um, and then there's there's outliers here. Um, some of them, you know, several actually are, are in within an institute somewhere, um, which is kind of interesting. And if we again, if we just look at the subset of the population. R1s basically follows that same model. We don't see much difference at all. Um, when we look at R2s, we see that um, somewhat fewer are reporting up into um, central IT and more into research. And when you go beyond the major research institutions, um, you see that it's much more diverse. Um, only about a third of them are reporting up through IT, a lot of them through a provost or dean or somewhere else on campus. So. I just thought that might be interesting as a little bit of background. Um, Y'all are welcome to go and explore that um, if you want to go see some more of the data yourself. But as sort of a prompt to, okay, this is the range of um, kinds of patterns we see in terms of reporting structures and where you sit on campus. And the discussion that we started having was, well, okay, given that, how does that impact who's actually making decisions for your program? To what extent, how much autonomy as a, a leader of a program do you actually have and how much um, is your budget being set by somebody else or are priorities being set by somebody else? And then the variation on that or the sort of follow on question was, you know, what kind of advisory group do you have? Um, and if you do, how, does, how do they function? And to what extent are they purely advisory? To what extent are they actually decision-making body at your, at your organization? And we just wanted to hear more from different institutions, what your experience has been and what your story is. So, you know, if you think about those questions sort of as prompts, we just want to hear from people. So whoever wants to start, please jump in and tell your story, or we'll start picking on you and calling names. Maybe I can get started with uh, what happens at Penn State. So at Penn State, uh, the research computing unit uh, is located within an institute uh, called Institute for um, Computational and Data Sciences. And that institute has two components. One is the research computing and data unit, which focuses on actually the core facilities and core services and also research facilitation. Uh, and then the other unit is actually uh, enabling research collaborations in the research computing and data uh, space. Uh, so that's that, that institute structure and that institute actually reports up to uh, senior vice president for research. So it's totally on the research side of things. There's nothing related to IT as such. Uh, but we do heavily collaborate with the uh, Penn State IT uh, teams on uh, the entire infrastructure and so on. So that's kind of the organizational structure. And uh, when it comes to advisory committees, uh, we have actually several different advisory committees and some of them are actually kind of committees that are making some decisions as well. So let me elaborate a little bit more. So there's one advisory committee called Power User Group, 
PUG, uh, where uh, these are the seven power faculty members who are big users of the uh, research computing infrastructure. Uh, they actually are helping make decisions on how the system uh, is uh, uh, operated in the sense the business model related decisions. Uh, then there's uh, cyber infrastructure faculty advisory committee that uh, kind of looks at uh, various policies uh, that we have around the you, uh, research computing facilities. Then we have external advisory committee, which comprises of uh, industry uh, folks, uh, lab folks, uh, uh, national lab folks, and uh, we are trying to recruit some potentially some policy makers uh, into that group. So that group is kind of focused on trying to guide where the landscape uh, research computing and data landscape is moving towards. Uh, so that uh, that gives better insights into setting the strategic direction for the institute. That's kind of the reporting structure and the advisory committee uh, committees at uh, Penn State. Anyone else wants to chime in? So I, I'm happy to jump in just so I can break the seal on talking at one of these things. <laughs> I've been lurking for a few. Um, so my name's uh, Dave Mellert. I'm Senior Director for Research IT at the Jackson Laboratory. We are a nonprofit um, research institute. We have academic affiliations, but we don't have like an academic structure. Um, research IT is uh, within IT. So I report directly to the CIO and um, IT reports up through finance. So I technically work in finance. Uh, <laughs> um, we so our scope includes um you know what i would consider infrastructure so the our on premises cyber infrastructure as well as our cloud infrastructure um we also have about half of the group also covers what i would call research applications which is still kind of infrastructure in a way so these folks support data a couple of data management platforms um, and laboratory informatics um, limb software so uh, we, in, in, among the infrastructure team, we have uh, cloud resources, obviously. Um, we're completely fully funded um, on hard money. So I don't have to write any grants. Um, I submit a capital and an operational budget every year. Um, that has to go through various levels of approval. Um, so we have um, research input coming in the form of um, a steering committee with um, we have two research campuses so there's two faculty from each one of those research campuses and our vice president for research also sits on that committee um, and i meet with them yeah, ideally quarterly um, and then any major decisions gets run get, gets run by them uh, but mainly we're operating out of out of it are there any other prompts there <laughs> I cover it. Um, no, I think that's it. Thanks very much for joining, Dave, um, and uh, for contributing. Yeah, thank you. So, is that like an oversight, Dave? They have oversight committee as such, or not really? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's mainly going to be just my leadership as well as the research, or sorry, the faculty steering committee. Yeah. So, you know, our budget gets reviewed like other budgets um, in IT. Um, but that's sort decisions, of decisions again. Yeah. Go it's ahead. a larger sort of financial situation review as opposed to how are you spending your money, right? Yeah. I mean, at a very granular level, um, I think we have a lot of flexibility. So, you know, nobody is, if we need to build a system for some purpose, nobody's nitpicking the details on that, right? I get to, I propose a budget and then we, we build it. If it meets the requirements, then I get to do that again in the future. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> maybe maybe there will be more oversight, but I, you know, we have a pretty good working relationship. Uh, the, the entire group actually is only about, um, eight years old. 
So previously our HPC and such was handled by what we now call our data sciences group, formerly computational sciences, uh, often other folks, other places would call this like research computing. So they work more directly with the research labs um, on specific projects to facilitate analysis or, or data management and things of that nature. So they were actually um, running the HPC that was purchased and sort of racked and all of that by IT, but they were really the ones uh, in charge of that. So it was kind of right, and they sit completely within research. So it was recognized that there was tension having research controls like they're, they, they're not really going into the data center right so there's this communication problem there and research it was was created for many of the reasons that you know um, everyone has something either called research it or similar to research it because um, it's nice to consolidate a lot of that work and decision making um, right right but yeah, but but we you know our group is staffed with I would say probably thirty or forty percent of our group are folks with a research background. Yep. No, I mean it sounds a lot like you know what's in an academic setting. That's why it's part of why we're really happy to have. We're trying to draw more people in outside of academia, so partly to see the parallels. Um, so, yeah, and it's yeah. you know to say you're not in academia is a little bit of a fudge, but. Um, no, I mean, we, we are, but we, you know, it, we don't have a university structure. Exactly. We have affiliations yeah. with UConn and Tufts and so on. So there's graduate students and postdocs and we call our lab heads professors and whatnot. Um, right. But the, the economics of it are a bit different. I don't know how familiar you all, all are with the Jackson laboratory, but we have, we sell mice to the research community. So we have a commercial arm and that produces a fair bit of revenue that, that gives us the ability to do things like fully fund research IT. Um, yeah. So who else wants to speak up? Especially folks from smaller institutions or, or others? I, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to chime in as someone from a smaller institution. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm Jason Sims. I'm the manager of research computing at uh, Swarthmore College. So we're a, you know, small considered highly selective liberal arts school um, just west of uh, Philadelphia. And I'm the I'm the first person in this role. The role was created and and I, I wouldn't say that it was created for me, but it was created um, that kind of emerged out of a similar role, similar role that I had at Lafayette College. Um, and it seemed to also make sense within the structure of Swarthmore and and so they, they thought it would be a good idea to do something similar. I, I report to the director of academic technology and much like Lafayette housing it in, 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 in the same team within ITS, we thought that that made more sense than housing it in a more systems or networking uh, facing team because the work that we do, like I think a lot of research computing teams um, or folks that run clusters or whatever, it is a very forward facing uh, undertaking. We work a lot with pedagogical applications. In addition to research, we work with a lot of students, a lot of student projects, uh, that kind of thing. So we we made a conscious choice to house it uh, right within that same team, which is very hands-on and provides a lot of uh, active, engaged support directly to the faculty and to the you know folks um, you know using our systems. Um, I. I work with my uh, manager um, to come up with our budgets. Um, we're lucky at Swarthmore that that um, we we have a you know fairly good pot to work with. Um, that it's certainly by no means unlimited, but if we can justify what we want to do, we 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 typically don't receive um, a lot of pushback on that. Um, you know, it's not just a free for all, but as long as we have good use cases and. Um, we can we can sort of uh, lay those out. Um, we we usually can get what what we need to advance the science, um, which is nice. The CIO here at at Swarthmore reports to the provost, which is different than what it was at Lafayette when I had the same role, where uh, the CIO there reports to the president and is a VP and therefore is part of that inner circle. So 
there are differences, and I think that there are positives and negatives to both of those kind of structures and sort of any structure really, um, you know, because some folks report to a, you know, VP of research or something like that. And I think that there can be advantages to sort of all of these placements. Um, I'm I'm happy if if people want to take that discussion farther about sort of the differences that I've noticed in those two. Um, I'm I'm kind of happy to do that if there are pointed questions on that point. Um, we we have a faculty advisory committee, um, and it is advisory. They 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 do not uh, dictate policy, as it were, but we find them extremely helpful for a couple of different reasons. Um, first of all, they're typically comprised of our heaviest users, and so we want to hear from them. We we want to know what's working, what's not necessarily working. Um, where their priorities are, the kind of work that they're envisioning doing in the next one, two, three, five years, that those kind of cycles, so that we can adjust accordingly and make sure that we're able to support them effectively. Um, we also value their input as sort of ambassadors for us to the rest of the faculty. Um, we find that faculty talking with other faculty is often much more useful than ITS talking to faculty, as it were. Um, we have great relationships with our faculty, but it just seems to be more effective in sort of peer conversations like that um, when we're either trying to evangelize what we're doing or to uh, onboard more people or to get um, more use out of um, like more use of our stuff within classroom situations, for example. Um, so that works pretty well. Um, and, and as some of you know, we actually are on the tail end of a project to merge our high performance computing environment with Lafayette College. And so that's interesting from an advisory perspective as well. We have so far decided to uh, not kind of do a joint advisory committee, but rather have separate advisory committees at, at each institution that if we need to um, bring that together, we can, um, but but we've we've discussed what the pros and cons would be of trying to coordinate folks at two different institutions and whatever. And 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 for now, we've decided against that. Um, so that's 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 kind of how it works from 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 our end. Cool. It's interesting. It sounds like a nice setup um, where you've got a reasonable amount of autonomy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, that that is correct. Um, we we do have a good amount of autonomy. Um, obviously, it has to be informed by the needs. I mean, you know, we're not just playing around with stuff. We are trying to advance, um, you know, real science and real teaching and, and stuff like that. But within that constraint, of course, we do have fairly good um, uh, autonomy to make our requests. Um, and yeah, so it is nice. So is there somebody who's got a fairly different story in terms of um, your sense of who's making decisions on autonomy and you know where does that where do you sit and how do you think that influences that? Mom, people speak up. <laughs> or is there anybody potentially who has, uh, you know, like maybe a joint ITS library relationship, which can also make for some interesting interactions? Paul? I can speak up. I, so I, I don't ever know whether I'm part of a big school or a small school. And that sounds contradictory coming from Harvard, but, you know, within Harvard, we, all the schools are independent. You know, they, we don't call them silos. We call them pillars of excellence. So, um, but we have an independent research computing group and it is a collaboration between the division of research, which I'm in, and then my colleague in IT is research technologies. And we have a group uh, within the Baker Library. That's Baker Research Computing and Data Services. And we partner really well together to define, you know, we, we did an exercise a few years ago where we started out with research use cases. 
And from that sort of defined all of the requirements covering all the use cases that we could identify um, and then use that to really plan our roadmap for cyber infrastructure. And that was a great exercise and everyone participated. We had about 20 people really participating in that. And so it was a really great collaborative effort. Primarily it's it's me within the division of research and Chris Lavalley within IT that's defining how we're moving forward with research computing. We do have a research computing advisory group. It's not a committee, it's an advisory group. It's a faculty advisory group that we meet with quarterly that has been incredibly helpful, sort of giving us feedback on how we're doing and how we're organizing and executing. Um, you know, we have, at the business school, we have about 300 faculty, probably about, that use research computing. It's, um, it's probably about 100 and it's growing because, you know, we're really a business school you may not think of a business school and research computing, but we're kind of a microcosm of the social sciences and social sciences are using more and more horsepower to, to look at data and, and analyze. So my team is primarily data scientists and statisticians, and that's, we work directly with faculty. We're, we're also independently funded. You know, the business school generates revenue that they use to fund all of their research internally. So yeah, we have, we don't have grant funded positions or anything like that. So that's a great advantage for us. Um, and then within IT, uh, Chris is building a small team that really is focused on the cyber infrastructure. And I kind of think of us as a kind of a meta team, like a bigger meta team, that, and it's a really strong partnership between us. You know, Chris's position is relatively new. He's been there about a year and a half. And I've been at the business school about, um, about five years, six years in January. And I think we we have a really strong partnership and are building a good plan going forward. So in that sense, you know, you mentioned partnership. We that's that's sort of our our uh, that's the way we've structured. I've been part of teams that were either completely within research and completely within IT. And there's always some struggle, you know, there's always some access, limited access to other parts. And for us, we have the advantage of being both within the division of research and within IT. So we can escalate up both chains of command to get things done if we need to. So, so I, it's a, actually a really nice partnership. Paul, did you say how many people work in your group? Um, it varies. I, I think I have about eight um, data scientists, statisticians, and we just hired a research software engineer slash data scientist. And you don't support any of the cyber infrastructure. That's what the IT collaboration is. Is that right? Yeah, they they have taken over the cyber infrastructure entirely at this point. And right now we're working on a project where we're building a research computing platform in the cloud. And that's gonna that's pretty exciting. And it's tailor-made for social science. It's not it's not the traditional HPC. We do have a small cluster on campus. It's about 20 nodes. It's tiny. Um, but it 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 does a good job, but we, we're kind of continually hitting our head on the ceiling um of, of of the limits of it so moving to the cloud for us is a really good idea so that's that's where we're going when you when you also you work with um it on this this is the business school it not broader campus yeah is that correct? business school it yeah yeah you know we do we do speak with folks in the medical school and in central campus and there is at Harvard, there is a research computing officer position that's in theory sort of supposed to connect with all the schools, but the schools are pretty autonomous. And, you know, I think Scott, this is Scott Yokel, who's yeah. a research computing officer for the university, does a good job of, you know, making sure everyone's talking, but really we have autonomy within the schools to do what we need to get done. 
And it works out really well because we do partner with the medical school. We I have faculty that are working on projects with medical school faculty, and we use medical school faculty, uh, medical school resources. And so we have a good partnership. And if you know any of our faculty really need more advanced horsepower, we we partner with you know Reminder Singh and FASRC. So we we have some good partnerships there. So we have the advantage of being you know size is a, always an advantage. So we can be very specific and and uh, meet very specific needs, but at the same time make use of our partners for more general computing resources. Thank you. Hi, I have a couple comments. Thanks. My name is Elizabeth Summers and I'm a project manager at Northwestern University. I sit within the Research Computing and Data Services Unit. Uh, so I'm relatively new to the group. So some of the things about budget and stuff I can't really speak to. I report to the Director of Research Computing and Data Services. You all may know Jackie Milhans. Um, and we sit within central IT. So we report up to our CIO. But however, we the group has grown pretty significantly over the last year or so, and several of those new positions were funded uh, out of the provost's office. So we're, I guess you could say we're tethered somewhat to the provost's office, even though we do report up through Central IT. And we also, as a couple of you have mentioned, we also have a collaboration with our cyber infrastructure group. So very close uh, partnership there. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. So Elizabeth, when you, um, how does that play out to the extent that you've seen it, understanding you're still pretty new. Um, mm -hmm. How does the um, that collaboration with the provost, especially funding those new positions, how does that play out in terms of, you know, how the group is organized and makes decisions? Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, it seems to be seamless, uh, but like I said, a couple of levels above me is where, all, you know, the budgeting comes and, you know, which organization is funding the positions and how uh, it may be separated at some point. But again, I, I'm not really privy to how a lot of that works, but as far as my position actually is one of those positions, but it you know, it's pretty seamless to me. I mean, we're, we're all, we all sit together, we work together on the same projects and, you know, one, an outsider coming in would not even know that. Um, it, I only know it because I sit on the, um, kind of the leadership team within mm -hmm. the unit. Okay. Yeah. Do you have an, a, a, like some sort of a faculty or researcher advisory group there? I, yes, we do. We do. I, I don't uh, I don't sit that on, on that advisory group, but we do have one here. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Who else? Don't be shy. I am, um, unless anyone else wants to chime in, one of the folks, I can't remember who, mentioned that they they wouldn't mind going into more detail about uh, some of the differences that they've seen in support of uh, research computing, depending on where the unit sits. If did I, Do I have that right? Did someone mention that? I, I mean, I mentioned that in terms of yeah. reporting up to the provost versus the president. Right. Yeah. I'd be interested in hearing some of those differences if no one else wants to talk about, you know, how they're structured. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to cede the floor if someone else wants to chime in, but I'm also happy to give a couple of thoughts on that. Sure. Well, okay. Go ahead. Hearing, okay. hearing done. Discussion. Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's, and and granted, I'm a bit removed from that level of things, but from, from my vantage point, I guess you could say, you know, the nice thing about reporting up to the provost is, it, it, well, let me, let me preface this by saying, 
the way that the provost is uh, selected at Swarthmore is different than where I've been before. Um, Swarthmore has it baked in that the provost will come from the faculty of Swarthmore. Um, and that is somewhat of an unusual structure. Usually the president is able to, should they want to, um, you know, choose a provost. And often that provost is someone with whom they've worked before, or they bring them from their prior institution, or they're from outside to bring in that perspective. But at Swarthmore, that's not the way it works. Um, and I think that at Swarthmore, for that reason, it's you, you kind of avoid potentially some of the problems that that structure could normally cause, because since they do come out of the faculty, you know, they've assuredly been there for, in some cases, you know, a couple of decades, you know, 15, 20 years. They have a lot of trust and experience with the faculty. They themselves have often been consumers of the very technology that you are now, uh, you know, kind of working with them to support on a broader institutional level. Um, and so it's worked really well. Um, I think that if the provost is external and comes with a lot of uh, ideas, um, you know, maybe to structure things in a similar way that they've had before, that can cause problems, especially if, or, well, problems is maybe too strong of a word, but it can potentially cause some confusion or some friction, especially if that role maybe turns over even every, you know, five, seven years, something like that, whatever the standard life cycle of a typical president is, you know, it's often not a decade, sometimes it is, but, you know, often provosts get replaced on some, you know, relatively short-ish cycle, which may not even last the lifetime of a single piece of equipment that you're interested in purchasing. And so that can be somewhat interesting. Whereas um, I've, I've found at Lafayette that the CIO serving as a vice president of the institution and having that sort of seat um, at the table with the president and with other VPs and uh, decision makers like that really gave us some good and useful insight into the goals and trajectories and plans and all of that stuff for the institution as a whole, which allowed us to tailor our message to show how we were able to further those goals. Um, you know, how could we deploy research computing and other ITS resources, you know, more broadly writ in support of the trajectory of the institution as a whole? Um, and so, you know, it certainly gave the CIO um, uh, access at a level that certain that that a lot of CIOs who don't have that similar reporting structure was able to have. Um, and, and we found that um, uh, very helpful as well. Um, it, it, you know, it did kind of divorce that role a little bit from direct interaction with the academic side of the house, because the provost often has direct oversight and activities specifically within the academics. Um, and so that's also helpful if you are trying to deploy your resources more in support of the academic mission of the institution and the sort of quotidian teaching and, um, you know, student support that the provost office might be able to provide. Um, but obviously, we were we were likewise in uh, discussions with the provost at Lafayette. It just meant that that ultimate reporting structure was a little different. So anyway, you know, those are some of the differences that 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 we found. Um, I will say that I like the fact at Swarthmore that the provost does emerge out of the Swarthmore faculty. Uh, because usually we know that person then very well um, already. And so there's a lot less of a, you know, learning curve and and we don't expect any curveballs out of nowhere that, oh, I think we really need to change this or whatever. Um, and it gives us a good relationship, you know, and, and a productive working relationship with them usually right off the bat. So that's just some thoughts. No, I think you bring up a number of really good points, Jason, and I'll go ahead and share a couple of things. It's been a little while. I, I retired from UC Berkeley about five years ago, but when I was there, you know, there's a number of things that what you were describing, Jason, resonated with experience that we had. Um, one of them was, you know, they, at one point there was a new provost that came in um, from another institution, and it wasn't even so much that they wanted to do a lot of new and different things as that they weren't as aware of um, the political and, and, um, and, and social landscape in terms of how decisions were made. Um, and they stumbled over that because they didn't understand who all they had to consult and just, um, you know, how much they had to be consultative. Um, and that caused them a lot of issues. Um, at, the, at the same level, when um, 
when our when one of the older CIOs had come in, that CIO was then a cabinet level position, uh, like what you're describing, um, and that individual managed to um, engender enough friction, I will say, with other members of that cabinet and elsewhere that um, by the time that person left, um, the role had been pushed down a couple layers and reported up through the CFO. Um, so personalities, you know, can are part of the landscape that we all operate in. And sometimes um, somebody does stuff like that. And they also, that CIO also um, burned a lot of bridges with a VPR. And when a new CIO came in, um, one of the things that he was great at was rebuilding those bridges. Um, he had been told when he was hired that research was a non-goal for the CIO, but he decided that um, he thought it was really important. And so um, he actually um, spent a lot of time going in and he actually took a bunch of his own discretionary budget and said, you know, I, I'm gonna um, contribute to building up a research computing program, um, which there hadn't been one at Berkeley. Um, like kind of like what Harvard describes in, when there's a school that has enough research funding, they often have the luxury of being um, highly federated and not particularly well um, coordinated. Um, they are not forced to be the way um, smaller schools sometimes are, um, but they were starting to cause a lot of problems at Berkeley. And so, um, but he, you know, the CIO was the one who decided, okay, I'm going to put some money on the table to get a program started. We ended up strangely, so we were, the RCD program was reporting up through the CIO there, which ultimately reported up um, through the, um, the CFO and the chancellor and not on the research side or the provost side. Um, on the other hand, the funding for the program um, was a three-way funding project between the CIO, the chancellor, and the vice provost for research. So um, that was kind of a delicate balance, but it also meant that we had a lot of people with skin in the game in order to make it successful. Um, and that was, we found that an interesting aspect of it, that it took a little bit more management to keep that collaboration intact. Um, but it also meant that there were more players um, that wanted to see it successful. Um, and we, like others have described, we used our um, faculty advisory group, not just to provide input on what we needed and where we needed to go, but also as advocates for us more broadly. So that when it came to budget time, for example, we had people who um, sat on the faculty senate and elsewhere and said, you know, and this was during a period where Berkeley was severely challenged by budget cuts. Um, and there were, you know, in the, in the 12 years that I was there, I think nine of those years, there were budget cuts across the campus. And uh, so just defending a budget um, was a major exercise and having those advocates out there was, was a huge thing. Um, we ended up actually moving into um, the academic side under the provost. And the reason for that was that the budget cuts were severe enough that the CIO, who was very, very protective of our group, was afraid that we would be up against um, maintaining the network and replacing Wi-Fi on campus. And so he actually helped organize us, reorg us underneath and, um, and at the academic side of the house, basically to protect our budget. Um, so weird things can happen. Um, and in the end, moving over into academic meant we had people who didn't understand research computing and we had to fight really hard um, to, for them to understand our budget and why we needed the budget we had, um, which was kind of a pain and to understand the collaborations we had all over campus. But it was one of those um, budget machinations things that um, was really important to our survival at the time. So um, those are probably some partial outliers in terms of our experience, um, but I'm kind of curious, you know, if any of that resonates with others who've been through, especially where you actually are going through budget wars. We had a lot of support on campus, but it was a really, really tough time. And so fighting for budget was a big issue. So we, we don't have to fight for budget as such, because we are part of the uh, research overhead. So uh, we are completely based on the overhead based budget. And we have been kind of uh, ring walled from what's happening at the university level, uh, because it's all grant based and that has been consistent at Penn State. So 
we haven't had that concern uh, as such at Penn State. I'm going to start pointing at people. Um, Tim and Dana, you've both been at small to mid-sized institutions. Anything here resonate or not with you all? Um, when I was at the University of Missouri uh, a number of years ago, uh, I reported up through the uh, CIO. And... Um, Part of uh, the difficulties there was building the relationship with the VPR. Um, after I left, uh, the VPR really started uh, investing in uh, research computing at Mizzou, and now they're building some some good relationships between the 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 IT side and the, the research computing side. Um, yeah, budgets were always a problem. I went through like three or four years of double digit budgets. Um, the first few were definitely needed. Um, but after that, it became that all decisions were bad decisions, so. You mean double digit budget cuts? Like double digit percentage budget cuts. Yeah. Like 15%, Harsh. 12%. Um, and then it was down to, to single digits. So that, that made it difficult, made it difficult. Well, we're running up close to the top of the hour. Um, anybody who hasn't spoken up who just wants to add a little bit, please do. So I guess one thing I'll add um, in my situation, uh, research computing in some sense was a standalone unit. Uh, we ran up most of our services, including the network. Um, so I think that gave us a little bit of autonomy from some of these frictions that can happen when portions of the infrastructure are uh, living within uh, IT and have different levels of uh, enterprise IT versus research IT type uh, uh, relationships that go on. So uh, that, that allowed, allowed myself as a director to have lots of flexibility in determining uh, uh, to how things went in terms of uh, uh, service levels and things like that. Uh, we did have some governance. Um, that, I think that worked out quite well. We had a CI council. Um, I forget what we called it, but uh, it provided some some good governance. When you say uh, governance, were they really weighing in on strategic decisions and budget, or was it really advisory? It was uh, it was advisory, um, and then I had a number of uh, what I called anchor tenants. Researchers that um, I worked well with, or the worked well with our group, worked well with the team, and um, were productive researchers and and, and investors, and they provided some some guidance on how, in terms of service offerings and service levels and things like that. So yeah, that's uh, responding a responding to their needs and how um, uh, their opinions uh, was very was very valuable. That sounds a lot like what we had, which was heavily informed by um, the guy who ran our HPC group, who was a um, long time in the community running um, high performance computing for Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And you know he was very, very careful to keep strong connections to the researchers, but was also pretty careful to say, this is an advisory group, um, not a decision-making group. Um, and you know that's, that was his advice, which I think was really useful to us when we were getting started. Anybody else? Want to throw in a comment? Well, we're just about at the top of the hour. Um, thanks everybody for joining the conversation. For those of you who shared your stories, um, been really interesting. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. We will let you know what our topic is going to be once the steering committee meets and has a chance to hash through ideas. If you have ideas for stuff you'd like to hear about, please do let us know. You can drop them in the Slack or send an email to us. We're always interested in hearing what people want to know more about or what they, they wish we would talk about. So please let us know. Amit, anything else? No, you covered it all. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. and. See you again soon.